Today I'm going to be preaching out of Matthew chapter 3 and chapter 4. You can follow along on the screens or just listen to me read it. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest, you're, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that over these next few moments, you would speak to us through this word. That every single one of us, no matter what we're walking through, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the season looks like, would have a tangible, real, meaningful encounter with you. So God, we invite you to do what only you can do. Only you can heal us. Only you can restore us. Only you can transform us. Only you can encourage the deepest parts of our soul. And so we give this space to you. We give our lives to you. And we ask that you would do whatever it is that you have planned for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you're in this room. Thank you, Jesus, that you're with us as we watch online. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us and you see us and you care for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. And thank you that your Holy Spirit is in us right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Why don't you grab a seat? Thank you, team. So glad you're here. My name is Mark. If we haven't met, myself and my wife, Roberta, are the lead pastors here at Rose. Hey, production team, could we just get that uh, thing queued on the screen? That would be awesome. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, before I start, I want to welcome some special guests, originally from here, but they moved to Vancouver. I know, they betrayed us. So rude. Originally from here, some good friends of mine and Roberta's, Troy and Jasmine. Uh, you might know Troy as the rapper Scribe. I don't know if, if you're familiar with his music, but he's great. But they're here all the way from Vancouver, so I just feel like that's pretty cool. Can we welcome them? So glad you're with us, guys. Just love them so much. Um, I want to give you my weekly Rome Evie Rosland update. If you don't know who Rome Evie Roslin is, she's the little girl, she's about this high, who runs around like she owns all of the cineplexes in Canada. So um, we love her. She's so much fun. She's uh, about 27 months now, so just over two years. And she's in this really like fun, enjoyable uh, season right now. She's a lot of fun. We're having a blast with her. She's starting to put like sentences together. The other day I had my first real conversation with her. It wasn't just a word from her and then me trying to understand her. It was like a real conversation. It was really cool. But she's doing a lot of fun things. Her whole existence revolves around is this thing that I'm doing funny. She wants to be funny. She wants to be silly and that's her whole world. And so um, everything she does is about that. But she started playing this game recently called sleep. And what she does is she puts myself or Roberta or myself and Roberta to sleep. I'm not going to lie. I love this game. It's the greatest game we've ever played. So what happens is she takes us by the hand and she leads us into her bed, not our bed, her bed. She tucks us in. She gives us a bunch of stuffies. She turns off the lights, turns on the sound machine, and then she closes the door 
and we have to go to sleep. And every 30 to 60 seconds, she comes in the room, she opens the door and she goes, shh, <laughs> even if we weren't making any noise. Because that's what we do to her when she's not going to sleep, right? We just keep coming in and shh, shh, Rome, time to sleep. So she tells us goodnight. She'll leave, come back in in, in 60 seconds. It's so fun. But it's actually, Roberta and I were talking about this yesterday, how we're actually scared of when she comes in. Like we are obedient to her. <laughs> so the other day I was, in, I was in her bed, I was sleeping, but I had my phone. So every time she would leave, I would, I would pull out my phone and I would be going. And as soon as I heard the door, I'd put my phone away and close my eyes. She'd be like, shh, and then she'd close the door, and I'd go back on my phone, and then it kept on happening. So, like, that's where we're at in our family. It's so much fun, but there's also a downside as she becomes more, you know, able to communicate. Um, she's a lot more, she's very stubborn. She's very stubborn like her mother. She's very defiant like her mother. She knows what she wants. Like, like she is Roberta to a T. And so we're actually struggling with her at the same time. It's like, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It's like one of those things all wrapped into one. So she's super like defiant and grumpy, throws like a temper tantrum every 20 minutes, like on the clock. In between, it's great. But then the temper tantrum comes and it's just like, it's crazy. But um, so, she, so she's amazing and she's very difficult. Uh, but the other day she did something super funny. I can't remember what it was, it was like right after a temper tantrum. She did something super funny and I just grabbed her and I whispered in her ear, I love you, I am so glad that you exist. And it went from this complete meltdown to this beautiful, incredible moment where I told her, I'm just like, I'm just happy you're alive. I'm so grateful you're my daughter. I'm just happy that you exist. And in this moment, that, this happened this week, and I was reading this text over and over. Immediately in that moment, I felt like I understood what happened in Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus is getting baptized, and he's done nothing really. And then heaven, the heavens open, and the Father speaks, the heavens speak. And what, is, what does heaven speak when it does speak? It says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In that moment where I grabbed Rome, I just felt pleased. I just felt proud. I was just happy to be her dad. And in this moment, God the Father, as the heavens open up, as he speaks over Jesus, says, hey, I'm just proud of you. I'm just glad you exist. I'm just glad you're mine. And, and you don't even just exist, but like, I'm proud of you. I'm so excited about what you're doing. And the funny thing is, is Jesus hadn't done anything. He literally was about to start. This was the beginning of his public ministry. But up until now, no miracles, no exciting things, no healings, nothing. You would think that at the end of Jesus's life, after he died on the cross and resurrected and ascended into heaven, God would be like, you're my son and I'm well pleased. That's how the world works, right? You deliver, you get results, and then people are proud. But heaven is backwards. The economy of God is different. His kingdom is upside down. Before you even do anything, before Jesus even does anything, he is well pleased. I love this moment because it establishes the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus before he's the Messiah, before he's the savior of humanity, before he's a healer and a rabbi and a great teacher and a miracle worker? He is the son of the father. And it also establishes the identity of God. Who is God? He is a father, a heavenly father, and not just any father or even heavenly father. He is a proud father. You exist, therefore I am proud. Now, this story, we cannot just insert ourselves into it, but what we can do is look and see the character and the patterns of God in it, and we can know that God is the type of God who relates to us as a father to his children, a father to his son, a father to his daughter, and we can see from the pattern here that he is proud before you even do anything. He is a proud heavenly father. He is proud of you. Some of you have never heard your earthly parent, your earthly mother, your earthly father say, I am well pleased with you. Some of you have never been told, I am proud of you. I'm grateful for you. I'm glad you exist. I'm glad you exist. But here we see the type of heavenly father that we all have access to, that we all have. And he is the kind of father who is so proud of you. Some of you need to hear that this morning. 
Some of you need to work really hard in this moment to receive that. Because it's one thing to hear it, it's one thing to understand it. And God wants you to know that he is proud of you. But you're like, God, but I haven't done much with my life. And last night I sinned. He's still proud of you. But God, I haven't reached my fullest potential yet. But God, I haven't got married yet. But God, I don't have kids yet. But God, I didn't get the promotion yet. But God, I, got, I lost my job. But God, I'm struggling in this season. But God, I don't have a lot of faith right now. He is proud of you exactly as you are. He loves you. He's obsessed with you. I love the imagery of a father and his children. There is nothing that could separate you from his love. There is nothing that you could do or anyone could do to separate you from the love of your heavenly father. And I pray that you would receive that today and just know. And if you get nothing else from this message, if you just tune out and just think about the goodness of God and how much he loves you, do that. Do that. This message is over for you then, and that's fine. But I, I love this moment establishing the identity of Jesus, establishing the identity of the Father. He's done nothing. I'm proud of you. I am well pleased with you. Heaven speaks in chapter three towards the end. Heaven speaks. What does heaven say when heaven speaks? It says, I am well pleased. I am a heavenly father who is well pleased. I noticed something interesting in these verses this week that I never really put together before until now. And that is that chapter 3, well, obviously, leads into chapter 4. But what happens in chapter 3, as you see what happens in chapter 4, is really interesting. I've never put these two together. I've heard chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. I've heard chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, but I've never put them together. See, what happens is, is immediately after the Father, the heavens speak, the Father speaks, you're my son, I'm well pleased with you. Jesus is led into the wilderness. And there, the devil shows up. And what does the devil do? The devil starts speaking. The devil starts saying a whole bunch of things. The devil's talking to Jesus. I learned this principle this week that when heaven speaks, hell screams. When heaven speaks, hell screams. Heaven spoke over Jesus, and now he's led into the wilderness, and here the devil shows up. Here Satan shows up. The enemy shows up and starts screaming. Heaven said one sentence. Hell says three paragraphs. Some of you are like, man, I just, I'm struggling because I feel like God spoke to me, and then every time God speaks to me, it's just like I start doubting. Yeah, because when heaven speaks, hell screams. Yeah, but I just had this really, really powerful prayer time, and it was amazing, and I sensed the presence of God, and then I haven't felt him for two months. God gave me all these ideas for this business, and I drew it out, and I talked to my friends, and I was so excited, and then the very next day, I was like, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough to start a business. And we get all confused. Did God really speak? Did God really say that? Did that really happen? Is he really proud of me? Well, if he was really proud of me, and if he really was a good father, and if I really was his son, well, then I shouldn't be here. The issue is, is that hell is screaming, and you have not figured out, and I have not figured out how to distinguish the voice of God and the voice of the enemy in our lives. And it's so easy to believe the lies that hell is speaking because it's the loudest. And it takes time and it takes focus and intentionality to begin to drown out the noise that the enemy is speaking, the lies that the enemy is speaking over your life and begin to go back to the original promise, the original word that God made to you. We get confused. We're like, what's going on? But we see this happen to Jesus. He's immediately led into the wilderness. The devil starts showing up and saying all these things. And we're not going to get into these specific three things that he says, but here's what the devil does. The devil begins attacking the identity that God had just spoken over Jesus. The first thing he says, if you really are the son of God, God speaks, the devil starts screaming, attacking the very foundation that God had just started to build. He always goes for your identity. He always goes for your identity. He'll attack your sonship. He'll attack your daughtership. He'll attack your royal standing. He'll attack your righteousness. He'll attack your identity. The temptation 
the attacks, the assault of hell will always be targeted towards the identity that God is trying to establish in your life. Because if you know who you are in him, you're off to the races. But if he can get you to question who you are and who he is, well, then you'll be all confused. It's the exact same thing we see in the, in the book of Genesis. The very first moment the enemy and human beings meet. Did God really say? Would that really happen? It's always an, an attack on identity. And here's what the enemy tries to do. If I could summarize these three attacks, the, turn, the, turn the stones into bread and jump off the temple and bow down to me and I'll give you all these nations. All of it revolves around shortcuts. It's all about taking shortcuts. If he can attack your identity and get you to take a shortcut and short circuit the process that God wants you to go on, he'll mess your whole life up. And he'll get you feeling entitled. This is what he did to Jesus. He's like, if you're really the son of God, you should turn these stones into bread. Why? Because you're the son of God. You shouldn't be hungry. You are entitled to be well fed. Oh, you deserve to have a little fun. Oh, you deserve to, to go there just once. You deserve to try that. And there's grace. He'll forgive you anyway. He's trying to get you to take a shortcut. He's attacking the path that God has for you. He's attacking the process that God has for you. He's attack attacking the plans that God has has for you. They all have to do with undermining God's will for your life. God didn't want Jesus to eat. He wanted him to fast for 40 days. God didn't want Jesus to jump off of the temple and to be saved by angels because what would result? The whole world would be like, look what just happened. He jumped off and all these angels came and, came, and now he would be revealed as the Messiah, revealed as the son of God to everyone in splendor, not in humility. The devil promised him all the kingdoms of the earth. The kingdoms of the earth were already Jesus's. He just had to go through the process of the cross to get it. God wanted him to work the process. The enemy said, I'll just give you the end result. Some of us are chasing the end result. And we allow the lies of the enemy to cause us to become entitled, manipulative, and idolize the end rather than the journey. And so we're sacrificing a lot. We're giving up a lot. But it's about shortcuts. It's about, the enemy's like, hey, you could just have the kingdoms. You don't have to die on the cross. I'll just give it to you. You don't have to wait three years and then they just, you know, you're finally revealed and then they kill you and then there's thousands of years of building the church. We'll just, in, in, in a moment, you're the Messiah and everyone will bow down to you. But that wasn't God's will. That wasn't God's will. But it would have been. Here's the thing. We look at this and we know if, as we read the story, Jesus overcame these temptations. And we'll talk about how he did that in just a moment. But oftentimes we read this story and we say, but yeah, that's Jesus. He's God. There was no way he was going to give in. He knew. Here's what we need to understand. This is what we often forget. Jesus was fully human. What we have to understand in this moment where the enemy is attacking the assignment of Jesus is that Jesus very well could have given in. He could have. And that might mess with some of your theology a little bit. He was fully God, but he was fully man. He could have been like, oh, you know what? I don't want to go to the cross. Okay, and bowed down. He could have. Of course he didn't, but he could have. So what gave Jesus the power? What gave Jesus the determination? What gave Jesus what he needed to endure through this attack? He begins to speak the word. He begins to declare God's word. The enemy is speaking. It's directly attacking what heaven has spoke. It's screaming in Jesus' ear, take the shortcut, your will over, over God's. It, this would be such a simpler life. This would be so easy. This would be instant. This would be immediate. You wouldn't have to care about what people think. Jesus comes back with the word of God. With the word of God. And I can't help but realize it's not just that he quoted scripture. See, sometimes we think, oh, I got to memorize scripture. You know, we do sword drills and uh, Psalm 23, blue. 
It's not about memorizing scripture. It's, a, it's not about just knowing the word. It's about knowing the God of the word. And I know that sounds cliche, and some of you have heard that before. But, but Jesus in this moment is not just quoting a Bible verse. He is describing who the Father is. He is describing what heaven is like. He is going back to the identity of the Father and back to his own identity and the dynamics that exist in their relationship. He knows God. He's not just quoting a word. The way that we overcome the attacks, the assaults, the temptations, the trials is the word of God. The promises of God, what he's spoken is written in stone. We don't have to doubt it. We don't have to question it. We just have to stand on it. In this moment, what does Jesus do? He stands on the word of God. He stands on the words of the Father. He stands on the words of heaven. And what happens? We read that when he kept on rebutting the devil's attacks with scripture, eventually the devil got tired. And what did he do? He left. Because when we speak the word of God, hell flees. When heaven speaks, hell screams. But when we speak the word of God, hell flees. How do you overcome the attack? How do you overcome the difficult season? How do you overcome the trial? How do you stand in victory? How do you stand in power? You stand not on your own strength, not on your own merit, not on your own righteousness, but you stand on the word of God. And it's not instant. This was a whole lot of, this was a process. And if I could get keys to join me on stage right now, Jessica, come on up. This was a process. This wasn't just like Jesus said, man shall not live off of bread alone, but on the word of God, and the devil was gone. No, there was three attacks. He's going to try to get into your life however he can. He's going to come at you from every angle and Eventually, we see the pattern here. He'll get tired like any bully, and he'll leave. He wants to destroy you. We have to be aware that there is a God who is for you, but there is an enemy who is against you. Reading the Bible is not just some Christian religious obligation. It is how we survive. Because you have a target on your back. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. He hates you with a passion. Once you're covered by the blood of Jesus, he hates you and wants to take you out. He's coming for your identity. He's speaking lies over your life. And the only way to combat the lies is not just to be like, well, I think I'm pretty gray. Well, I No, it's to be like, man, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not enough. You're not worthy. You're not smart. You're not good. No, I am more than a conqueror in Christ. Man, I just feel like God is so far. He must not like me because I've made too many mistakes and I've sinned too much. No, nothing, neither heights nor depths, nor, nor rulers of the air, nor rulers of men can separate me from the love of God. We gotta keep coming back. We overcome with the word of God. We stand on the word of God. We go back to the promises. We go back to the moments. We That's why we build altars so we have something to look back on. Because he'll get us all confused. No matter how mature you are, no matter how long you've been following Jesus, I don't care if you're in this room and you're 89 years old, the devil is whispering lies and speaking lies. And we overcome and we get through it by standing on the word. But not just quoting scripture, but knowing the God of the word. Your relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship you'll ever have. Your time in the morning with Jesus or in the evening with Jesus or in the car with Jesus, your time in the word, your time in worship, it is the greatest investment you could ever make. And my fear for the church is that like we come on Sundays and we get the word and it's enough to get us to next Sunday, right? Or we're like, man, I got a good job and I got good friends and I got food on the table and life is pretty good. But what we don't realize is we've settled for a good life and God wants us to live a great life. How do you get access to a great life? You worship and connect with a great God. We want to allow allow him to lead us, him to guide us, him to speak to us, that we would know his voice. And whether it was scary or easy, we would respond in obedience. The whole point of this thing called walking with Jesus is about our relationship with him. It's not about Sundays. Sundays are great. 
It's not about connect group. Connect group is great. It's not about serving. Serving is really great. It's not about putting your kids in Rose Kids. Rose Kids is great. It's about you and him. It's about your Monday. It's about your Tuesday. It's about that day at work. It's about when you want to like yell at your kids. That's what it's about. It's about doing life with him. When heaven speaks, hell screams. Don't get all confused when you're like, man, yesterday was great, but today feels like a spiritual attack. It's because it is. It is. But you're like, but I, but I, I just like work a job. I'm not a pastor. No, you're not a pastor, but you are a minister of the gospel. It's not just pastors who get attacked. It's ministers of the gospel. When heaven speaks, hell screams. But when we speak the word, hell flees. Man, the devil does not want you in the word of God. The devil does not want you to work on your relationship with Jesus. He wants to keep tormenting you. He wants to keep speaking lies to you. He wants to keep confusing you. He wants to hold you down. His end goal is to destroy you. But we overcome with the word of God. I've never noticed this sequence either, chapter three to four, but chapter four to five, six, and seven. Do you know what happens in chapter five, six, and seven right after this? Does anyone know? Roberta, do you know? Troy, do you know? Yeah, Troy doesn't know. That's okay. Sean, do you know what happens after this? No, he doesn't know. Huh? Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon ever preached. The most beautiful theological framework for what it looks like to live a life with Jesus. If I got up here and just read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 every single week, y'all would be blessed. It is that good. In fact, I should start doing that. It saved me a lot of time, effort, and stress throughout the week. Preparing these messages is a work of, work of love. Labor of love. One of greatest, one of Jesus' most greatest moments of impact came after and out of one of his greatest trials. The biggest lies the enemy will speak over your life, the loudest lies the enemy will speak over your life often come right before your greatest impact, your greatest promotion, your greatest acceleration, your greatest momentum. Jesus from this moment leaves and preaches the greatest sermon ever preached. The greatest lies in your life, the loudest lies in your life will come right before the moment of your biggest impact. But fret not, because God has a plan, God has a strategy. See, what you see and what I see as a temptation and a trial God sees as a test, but not like a pass or fail test, but as a process for getting you ready. Because the assignment on your life is weightier than the test. The moment of temptation is to prepare you for what's next. See, the enemy wanted to use it to take you out. Man, I'm gonna speak these lies, I'm gonna attack their identity, but God is using it to prepare you. Because what's coming next is greater than where you're at right now. And you can't walk into your assignment. You can't walk into your impact. You can't walk into the next thing until God has done a little work in your life and gotten you ready for what's next. See, you saw it as a setback. God is setting you up. You saw it as a trial. God is setting you up for triumph. God is setting you up for victory. God is setting you up to win. But you need to be prepared. You need to get a little muscle. You need to get a little confidence. You need to get a little bit more of what is needed for that next season. So it's not, oh, I'm drowning. No, it's, it's working out. It's boot camp. The enemy's using it to destroy you. But God's like, I'm with you. It's just boot camp. It's just training. It's just preparation. I'm just getting you ready for the next thing. So what do we do? What do we do then? 
Well, obviously, we fight to hear God's voice over the screams of hell. We get with Jesus. We spend time with him. We get to know him and let him get to know us so we can stand on the word. And we just got to push through a little bit. We just got to push through a little bit. Jesus stayed hungry. Jesus stayed in the will of God, knowing that three years from now, he would go to the cross. See, so much of our lives revolve around our feelings. Do you think Jesus felt like dying on the cross? Do you think the apostle Paul felt like suffering for the gospel? So much of our lives were like, well, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like supporting my spouse in that way. I don't feel like telling that person about Jesus. I don't feel like going to work today. I don't feel like showing up. I don't feel like following through with that commitment. It's too hard. It's too painful. It's too difficult. It doesn't feel good. It's not about your feelings. Sometimes we just have to push through. And on the other side of pushing through, if man, if you can make it through chapter four, by God's grace, in chapter five, six, and seven, is your purpose, is your destiny, is your assignment. You gotta overcome the attack. There is an, an assignment on your assignment. But by God's grace, as we stand on the word, as we cling to Jesus, he gets us through. The word authority has been ringing in my spirit for the last few weeks. I think so often we come to church, we hear a powerful word, hopefully it's powerful, hopefully it's good. Thank you. But then we leave and we don't see it, its application in our lives. And I think it comes down to this word authority. Let's go full circle. Let me remind you who you are. You are a son of the King of Kings. You are a daughter of the Lord of Lords. The creator of the universe created you and his Holy Spirit dwells in you and gives you power. He is your advocate, your counselor, your supporter, your defender, your best friend. He is your leader and your guide. And he has given you authority, authority to declare his word, authority to heal, authority to cast out demons. He has given you authority. And so I, I want our church, what would it look like as we begin to walk in authority? And it's a whole journey to figure, what does that even mean? I don't entirely know, but I feel like it has something to do with always just going back to like, God is powerful, he's my father, he's a king, I'm a prince, so like, that's not a big deal. Jesus spoke to the storm in the gospels, he was in the boat, he was taking a nap. He gets up and he speaks to the storm and the storm stops, that's authority. The disciples marvel, who is this who has the authority to stop the wind and the waves? You and I have that same authority. John 14, 12, you will do even greater works than I do because I am sending the Holy Spirit. Roberta said the other day, I just wish I could meet Jesus. And I wish too that I could meet Jesus but we have the presence of Jesus inside of us. Everything that Jesus is, is inside of us. We have power and authority. We are anointed. We are called. We have talent and purpose and destiny. We have authority. We have authority. So what would it look like as we leave this place to just have authority? That our souls would be a little, a little more confident, a little more arrogant that the attacks and the lies of the enemy would just mean a little less. Why? Because you have authority over the enemy. He's no match for you. The economy is no match for you. I get it. It's a stressful time financially in this economy. It's no match for you. Because your job isn't what provides for you. He, he provides for you. The pains of this, of this life, they're no match for you. You have authority. You have authority. And your authority comes from the word of God, and it comes from the person of God. Band, would you come?